Good morning. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, good turnout. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wakefield, for a wonderful talk. And um, I'm sure that would go a long way, including ourselves, in uh, you know, managing these patients with Parkinson's disease and those have urological symptoms. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, gait and balance difficulties in Parkinson's disease. Everybody with Parkinson's disease eventually has gait and balance difficulties as they go along, you know. Um, and I think it's a very important and a complicated topic uh, that sometimes incorporates the, the disease itself and some of the medications and the interventions that we do um, uh, and some of the you know, conditions that go just along with aging like, and, and other stuff like high blood pressure and, and, and its management. So nothing to disclose here. And then, so people with Parkinson's disease are three times more likely to fall uh, than their peers. Like if you, if you compare um, the same age people uh, and, they, and, they, and, and you follow them along, people with Parkinson's disease are three times more likely to have falls as compared to their peers. Um, that, that's a significantly higher number. Um, and then 70% uh, of Parkinson's disease patients report at least one fall a year. And it, it just takes one big fall to have a, a huge injury like a, a hip fracture or you know, you know, some other um, like head injury. Sometimes people with Parkinson's disease have they're on um, blood thinners, Coumadin, okay? And then they're at risk of having bleeding. So if they fall and they hit their head the wrong way, they can have you know, brain hemorrhage, subdural hematomas. Um, so very, very important. Um, and then 50% of Parkinson's disease patients report recurrent falls. So it's not just one fall, but recurrent falls. Um, and then in 13%, uh -oh. okay, thank you. So 13% report more than one fall a week. And most of these people have several falls a week, okay, or several falls a day even. So, you know, you multiply that the possibility of injury several fold uh, with the increasing number of falls. And then the, uh, the, um, it's in 30% of ED visits, of patients with Parkinson's disease, you know, the falls is the reason that they come to the emergency department. And then uh, Parkinson's disease patients are 1.3 times more likely to attend uh, ED uh, or the emergency department due to injuries as compared to you know, other people with, this, with similar age. So it tells you that this is a big problem, okay? Very frequent and significant problem. It's, so it's very common. Um, and then, so where do these falls happen and what are the implications? So what happens when these pe people fall? Where do they fall? And, and you know, what's the circumstances surrounding those falls? So most falls happen indoors. You know, people would say, you know what, I walk more when I go outside, but why do I fall more inside? So you know, it's you know, counterintuitive, but this is what happens. Most falls that happen are actually indoors. And then... Um, so, the, most falls are not usually life-threatening, but they can end up, you know, people having head injury or a, a broken hip or something like that. And we'll talk about that in, in, in a few slides later. All right. Most falls are harmless and they're circumstantial, like they, we call them intrinsic falls. And that happens because, you know, we, you're walking along and then you decided to turn. You know, for, for people who don't have Parkinson's disease or they're, you know, they have, you know, um, intact balance, that shouldn't be a problem. But with people with Parkinson's disease, making sudden turns is actually a big deal. And most of the falls occur because they, they were walking and they made a turn. Or they were trying to sit down and they, somebody spoke to them and they turned around and then they fell. And, uh, and a lot of the, those falls are during transfers. You know, I was sitting on a chair and I wanted to get to the bed and I fell down. Or I was, you know, I, I'm using a walker, I'm reaching my chair, and I'm, as I'm transitioning from the walker to the chair, you fall. So, so transitioning 
is a very, very common and complicated and um, it provides this, this, this time that increased risk of falls during that time. And dual tasking. So, and we'll talk, we'll talk about that in a, uh, in a later slide as well. But um, people who have Parkinson's disease, they have problems with dual tasking. Dual tasking means you're trying to do two things or multitasking, two things at the same time. Um, when we are walking, when we're, you know, so normally we can walk and talk at the same time or we're checking our phones and walking, you know, usual. But people with Parkinson's disease, those, those dual tasking uh, things become increasingly more difficult. And then they have to pay attention to each and everything that they're doing. Uh, and then, uh, so, that, so when, when they try to, for example, if they're walking and they, they're not falling and suddenly somebody, you know, addresses them, you know, and then they, they, so they divert their attention from walking to that person and then that's when they fall, okay? So it's very common. So, so information about these things and, and how these people fall is important because you can learn and you can say, you know what, I, I'm caring for a person who has Parkinson's disease. When they're walking, I will wait till they approach and they sit down and then I'm going to say what I want to say, especially if it's not something important. So things, simple things like that can make huge differences. Um, and usually, um, people who fall with Parkinson's disease, they, they have you know, a hip fracture from the fall. And actually 25%, so or one fourth of the patients, um, they actually develop a hip fracture within 10 years of diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. So that's a, a big number. And then we'll talk about why they're predisposed to that. And, uh, uh, and, and then hip fractures are, you know, in Parkinson's disease, they have um, a high risk of being, en you know, ending up in, in the nursing home. And, um, and then they have a higher mortality and morbidity. So a regular person without Parkinson's disease, they fall, they fracture their hip, they will have surgery, they will have physical therapy, maybe go to a nursing home and then come out, and then they're fine. But people with Parkinson's disease, you know, they have higher morbidity mortality and they end up in the nursing home and then they may, you know, may stay there. So that's, so very important to figure out what causes these falls and, you know, try to address them and prevent them, you know. So, so when does it happen? So along, you know, as, as you're um, moving along the disease, you can see, you can see the, the pointer. So early disease, you know, the honeymoon period that Dr. Shah mentioned, um, so people don't have any balance problems to start with. Medications are, you know, either not needed or if you're taking them, they're, they're working very well and there's no balance problem. So in early disease, there are almost no falls. But as the disease progresses, you know, people are still active, physically active and they're healthy otherwise. So, and then they, and that's when they start having balance difficulties and that's when they have the hard falls. That's when, they, when people actually, you know, fracture their hips and they have significant amount of the hard falls during the intermediate phase. And then later in the disease when people are le even less active, you know, they're, they're sh shuffling more, they're not uh, you know, physically active anymore, so that's when they either fall less frequently or when they do fall because of the low speed, they have low impact falls, so soft falls, so soft tissue injuries, they usually don't have you know, hip fractures or, or huge, huge um, type of you know, injuries at that time. Um, so moving along. So, so what are the costs of falls? You know, so the cost of falls, you know, people can die from it. So somebody, uh, he, huge subdural hematoma, and they end up you know, passing away. Or they're hospitalized, you know, significant, um, and, and each hospitalization in Parkinson's disease is a huge, huge event. People have, may or may not have cognitive impairment, they're taking these medications every two or four hours, and they have to take them, you know, regularly, uh, and then they're, um, they're, they're sort of used to their environment at home, and suddenly they find themselves in the hospital or the nursing home where nurses are, you know, giving medications, but then the medications are three times a day, you know, along with everybody else, or they, they're, they're not exactly the same time that the people are, you know, used to, and they end up, you know, running out of the medication, and then they're stiffer and slower, they start having hallucinations, they start having, you know, um, you know um, uh, a lot of issues. And then, th so that is a huge, huge issue, admission to a hospital, hospitalization. So, 
and then of course the longer they stay in the hospital, the more likelihood of having those things. And then nursing home placement, of course, fear of falling and functional decline. I think this is a very, very important part that is often overlooked. People who even have one single fall, okay, and then even if it's not a huge fall, they don't have a huge injury, but you know they become scared. You know they say, oh, oh my God, this is possible. I'm sorry, I've started falling, and then they limit their activities, and then that leads to functional decline, and they have this genuine fear of falling. I, the other day I saw a patient. You know he, the balance was fine, but the patient had such a significant fear of falling that he wanted me to make sure that there are two people side by side watching him when he's walking without his walker. You know, so it is, it is a huge deal. Um, so poor quality of life, you know, that goes without saying, and, and fall-related injuries. So people with Parkinson's disease have other, other things too, right? Uh, so they, they don't have just Parkinson's disease, they're, they're aging. They have the normal age, so they have back issues, they have lumbar radiculopathy, or sciatica as you call it. You know, pain going down. So every time they sit down or they stand or they lift something, they have this intense pain in the back. Okay, that can, that can induce, you know, symptoms and anxiety and pain and limit their movement as well, in addition to Parkinson's disease. People have poor vision, you know, um, that needs to, people with, with diabetes, they need their annual, you know, physical, annual um, eye examination. It's very important. Uh, they develop cataract and sometimes, you know, in the midst of uh, all the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, you, you find out, you know what, uh, he, he had a cataract, we never knew about it, you know. So cataract, you know, I think a trivial thing to say, but then it's very important. Uh, sleep apnea, people with sleep apnea, like Dr. Wakefield said, they have more you know, risk of having, you know, nocturia or peeing more at night, and that, you know, that can, uh, you know, compromise the quality of your sleep, and then the next day is just more fatigue and more slow, and then uh, more Parkinsonism. Um, and then um, people with sleep apnea, they have, um, they're sleepier and they're less attentive when they're walking, and then that compromises their ability to, like if they, somebody were to talk to them while they're walking, that, that, that they would higher risk of falls at that time. Um, and vertigo and ear problems, very important. Um, arthritis of the hips and knees, you know, uh, neuropathy, a lot of people with Parkinson's disease, actually there's a study ongoing, people with Parkinson's disease, even if they don't have other conditions like diabetes, which is the commonest cause of neuropathy, they can still have a neuropathy uh, and that can, you know, um, cause difficulty in uh, trying to f figure out, uh, you know, which, where their legs are or feet are in space and then that can compromise their balance and faults. Um, so, so let's try to understand the, 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 the problems, uh, you know, the, the risk of falls. Um, so if, if, if I can try to simplify this, this can be, you know, extrinsic and intrinsic. So ex extrinsic would be, you know, there's a rug on the floor, there are stairs, there are uneven surface that can, you know, that can be challenging for anybody but then especially people with Parkinson's disease, it's more difficult for them to navigate those stairs. People with Parkinson's disease have this uh, you know, difficulty of picking up their feet when they walk. So they're shuffling, they're taking smaller steps, and, uh, and then when they're, suddenly they're, they're faced with you know, a flight of stairs, then they have to either hold on to the railing and then pick their feet up, and it's, it's, a, it's a huge deal. So stairs and, and uneven surfaces and, and wires and suddenly people coming across you know, their, their, their way, so those are extrinsic factors. But intrinsic factors, intrinsic factors mean the, the disease, Parkinson's disease itself, the medications that we would give to treat symptoms of Parkinson's disease uh, and the complications, and some of the interventions that we do like DOPA pump and, and DBS. So all these things, they sort of, you know, uh, cause and affect whatever. So they, 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 lead to, they lead to imbalance, they lead to orthostatic hypertension, uh, more freezing, and dyskinesias, and dyskinesias, like Dr. Dr. Shah mentioned, they, these are the the more uh, excessive involuntary movements, like Michael J. Fox, uh, and they, people can't really sit still when the medications are they're working. They start to move more, and that can actually lead to a lot of falls. Um, freezing, uh, and we'll talk about that uh, uh, in more detail in a few slides later. Uh, freezing is you know when um, when you're trying to walk and and suddenly for no physical reason. There's, there's sudden, either you stop walking 
or there is a significant reduction in the speed of walking. Um, and then that, that's te usually temporary and then people you know, overcome it for you know, different ways. We'll talk about that. Orthostatic hypotension, you know, um, the, there's, there's, a, there's a, the, the central nervous system that we have, the brain, the spinal cord, and the nerves. And then there's the, the autonomic nervous system. Autonomic, it's, it's auto, autopilot. You know, our heart rates, our blood pressures are maintained even without our conscious effort. We stand up, our heart rate increases, our blood pressure goes up, and then we, we're, we're not lightheaded. But people who have impairment in their autonomic nervous system, um, that, that, that uh, the, the heart rate does not go up high enough, or the blood pressure actually pools in, their, in your legs, and then less of the blood is available for the heart to pump to the brain. So it, the, the, the blood pressure is actually again, working against gravity. So gravity is trying to pull the blood down and pull it in your legs, and less of it is available for your brain. And when your brain does not get enough blood, you become lightheaded, you become dizzy, you become you know, weak in the legs, and people tend, end up falling. Uh, it's not a very, very common cause of falls in Parkinson's disease, but it's a significant you know, a hindrance in the ability to focus and stand and walk. So we'll talk about that in a second. And then, you know, imbalance in general. People with Parkinson's disease, like Dr. Shah mentioned, they, 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 they are sort of, when they, they're bent at the, the legs, at the knee, at, at the hips, and they're bent forward as if they're a center of gravity, they're trying to catch up to the center of gravity. When they walk, they, they, they take, take these short shuffling steps. And as one of my patients, uh, you know, rightly said, it's as if they're trying to prevent themselves from falling backwards. So they're bending forwards. So, so that, that's an innate problem in their balance that happens with Parkinson's disease. And then, uh, so we'll talk about the freezing of gait. Okay, I touched uh, briefly on it in this past slide. So freezing of gait, a brief episodic absence or marked reduction in forward motion despite an intention to walk. Okay. Um, this usually happens in advanced stages of Parkinson's disease. 81% of uh, uh, people with Parkinson's disease develop freezing of gait uh, in about 20 years. And it, it, it may even happen earlier, uh, especially if you've been on you know, dopaminergic medications, Cinemet, dopamine agonists. Uh, if the earlier you start, there is evidence that you know, earlier you start having these side effects, uh, freezing of gait, uh, dyskinesia, and stuff like that. So risk factors for freezing of gait, uh, you know, non-gait freezing. Sometimes people, you know, they're, they're trying to write, and then suddenly they stop. Or um, you know, people um, they're they're not trying to walk, but they're trying to wipe their feet, and then they, they can't wipe their feet. You know, so these are the non-gait things that you know can can tell you you know this person is at risk of having freezing of gait. And then of course, e increasing dopaminergic medications, uh, higher doses of cinnamon, frequent doses of cinnamon every two to three hours, um, and then dopamine agonists. Um, Falls and near falls. If somebody has, you know, falls in the past or near falls, then they freeze more. And then, you know, people who have uh, starting to develop memory problems, you know, they are more likely to have freezing of gait. So um, here I try to, you know, further um, differentiate between types of freezing of gait. I think it's very important um, that, you know, when people freeze, uh, it can be challenging for the average physician and a general neurologist, sometimes, sometimes even for movement disorder specialists to figure out what causes the freezing. And that, that's a, a key question that we ask every patient who is falling. Uh, and then, do you freeze? Oh, yes, we, 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 yes. We, you know, when do you freeze? When we're walking, we start walking, or when we're approaching a narrow door or an elevator, or, you know, we suddenly fall, okay. Or suddenly freeze, I'm sorry. So, so we try to figure out, is it an off-state freezing, an on-state freezing, or it's an unresponsive freezing? It's too dark blue, hardly did. So off-state reading, off means when the medications are um, not working, or when the medication has the worn off. You know, they're more stiff, more slow, and most of the people, uh, the freezing that they have is off-state freezing. And the key to that is, you know, when, when, I, when I take my medication um, and, you know, after 30 minutes of my medication use, I don't freeze anymore. And I freeze when the medications are wearing off. So, so try to identify these patterns 
um, in terms of when your medication, you know, you use the medication, when it starts working, and when it's wearing off, that you, you know, want to find out. That's the off state freezing. And it's very easy to treat. You know, you just increase the medication dose or, you know, treat with dopaminergic medications, you less, freeze less. Now, people with on state freezing, when people say, you know what, I, when I medica my, my medication is working, I feel less stiff, less slow, but I still freeze, okay? So that, that may still be something called pseudo-on, that people, uh, they, they feel they're you know, less slow, less stiff, um, because their, med their medication is working otherwise, but they can actually have even better control of their you know, stiffness and slowness by higher doses of medication. And in those patients, you actually you know, give higher doses of medication, they feel even less uh, stiff, even less slow, and they freeze less, and that's how you find out this was actually a pseudo-on freezing. And then true on freezing, that is actually uh, caused by dopaminergic medications. So you, you say, you know what, my medications are wearing off. I feel stiffer and slower, but I don't freeze as much as compared to when I take my medication. My medications, when, when they're working, um, you know, I, 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 I feel less stiff, less slow, but then I start freezing more. So, so you see the, the total opposite uh, of what you may expect. And then there are some people that are, you know, truly, that we don't know what the cause is. It doesn't matter, if the, you know, you take the medication, you don't take the medication, you take higher doses, you take lower doses, they still freeze. And that's still possible. So, so I think this is a very important slide. Um, people with normal aging without Parkinson's disease, when they, when they get, go out of balance, they, they extend their arm out and then they fall. And if they, they were to develop a fracture, they would actually develop a wrist fracture or you know, an arm fracture or something. But people with Parkinson's disease, when they fall, they fall like a log. They don't, they don't extend their arm out. They, and they're, and they're, because they're stiffer and they're slower and everything is slow, so, they, so what, what happens when they fall, they don't extend their arm out. And, and they end up you know, end, uh, landing on their hip and that's how people with Parkinson's disease, if you compare Parkinson's disease patients with, with um, regular folks uh, who, are, who are aging, you will see that Parkinson's disease patients, the, the risk of having and the frequency that falls result in hip fractures is more, is because of this reason. And then um, medications. So, um, so the, uh, you know, sometimes it's us causing, you know, freezing or, or difficulty walking. So uh, adverse effects of medications in gait and balance. So people with on time freezing, I just mentioned that in the, in the previous slide, people, you, you know, you're giving this medication, it's helping other symptoms, the stiffness and slowness, and other, other, but then it's, it's, it's causing the on time freezing, which is not very common, but it may happen. Drug-induced dyskinesias. Dyskinesias, like you said, are excessive involuntary movements that happen when the medications are working and people start moving around. And then, uh, so the more medications you give, so as the disease progresses, um, you need higher doses of medication to have the same amount of help in stiffness and slowness. But then as, as, a, as a side effect, people start moving more than they're supposed to or they want to. And those are called dyskinesias and that. So, uh, and that can actually induce falls. Um, and then improved mobility. So I put it in there. So, you know, you, a, a person who is, stiffer and slower, and, and they, because of the stiffness and slowness, they're not walking as much, okay? But then suddenly you say, okay, you know what, let's start some medication, we give you some medication, and then now you're less stiff and less slow, and then you're moving more, and that actually can cause people to fall down, okay? So, so improved mobility can actually lead to more falls in Parkinson's disease. Orthostatic hypotension, but people who have REM sleep behavior disorder uh, their bodies are not paralyzed. So if they're watching themselves being chased by somebody, they will actually run on the bed and then they end up uh, either hurting themselves by falling off the bed or hurting their bed partner or something like that. And that's a very common cause of morbidity and disrupted sleep. And then the next day they're you know, fatigued and, and, and sleepy. But then also uh, people need uh, clonazepam, which is a very good medication. It's a benzodiazepine. Uh, the, the side effect of that medication is it causes more fatigue and somnolence, and it's a longer-acting medication. If you're taking more than two, two times or two times a day, it's probably higher than what you might need. Um, 
uh, but then people who, have, who are on benzodiazepines in Parkinson's disease, they are more likely to have falls. Um, people who have leg edema, people develop leg edema due to, due to um, uh, some dopaminergic medications like uh, dopamine agonists, uh, and that can sometimes cause difficulty walking, blurred vision, you know, uh, and hallucination, psychosis, and hazardous behavior as a result. Uh, sometimes people have um, hallucinations, like Dr. Uh, Shah mentioned, and when they have hallucinations, sometimes they are trivial, and then you know, the transient um, shadows across their vision, visual fields. Uh, that's not a problem. But then when they have more complex um, hallucinations that they start interacting with or they start responding to, that can sometimes lead to you know, confusion and, and, and a behavior that may end up you know, putting them in a situation that they may fall. Um, interventional therapies uh, like, like DUOPA or um, DBS, uh, and like, you know, time of therapy and falls. It's very important. If you, um, if you have uh, Parkinson's disease and you have, um, you decide to, you know what, I, I'm not falling right now and uh, I'm, going, I'm going to have deep brain stimulation surgery. Uh, and then, so that sort of preserves your, um, your uh, you know, uh, physique, your ability to ambulate. And then, um, so that, that sort of changes your, your, your um, um, you know, outlook. If you were, if you were, if you're not having an interventional therapy like deep brain stimulation surgery, and then you're you're continued along the curve that you're you're you would go otherwise, you will see that you know with increasing slowness and stiffness and reduced mobility, you will lose muscle mass, you will develop osteoporosis, and then you will feel you will be weaker. And then you start having, you, then you have deep brain stimulation surgery, um, so then you may still continue to fall. However, if you have deep brain stimulation surgery earlier, that will preserve your muscle, so, your, you know, you, so that you can, you can imagine that that will lead to you know, preserved mobility and balance in the future. It's possible. However, if you do deep brain stimulation surgery at a later stage, okay, when, uh, like I mentioned, you know, you, you're having this slowness and stiffness, and then you certainly have this intervention or your medication that is actually helping you walk better. Then you start having falls because now you're you know walking faster, and then you and then you, you start falling. And sometimes people with deep brain stimulation surgery or DUOPA they can have more dyskinesias, and that can cause you know uh, falls. So let's go this. So time of therapy falls from increased mobility. And earlier, so the, I spoke about that already. Uh, and DUOPA, um, so, so DUOPA, of course, uh, just like Cinemet, you know, you have off time freezing. When the medications are not working, you're stiffer, slower, and you're freezing. But you give higher dose of medication, you, f you freeze less, and you fall less. Uh, but uh, there is evidence that shows that people who have on time freezing, that means the medications are working well, but you're still freezing, and you have DUOPA, that can actually help with freezing as well. And then, uh, you know, like anything else, uh, it causes more dyskinesias, so that may predispose falls indirectly. So DBS and falls. Uh, so, you know, so it may help uh, if the, 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 uh, the, uh, there's off freezing, there is um, slow, slowness and stiffness that is causing balance difficulties, so it may help. But we almost never guarantee an improvement in, in gait and balance as a target for deep brain stimulation surgery. If you're coming for DBS evaluation, and then you say, you know what, um, this is my number one concern, my falls and gait and balance, we say, you know what, you need to re reorganize your priorities, because this probably will not, we cannot, we never guarantee it. If you get improvement by it, fine. If you don't, you know, that's, we, we've already, Discuss that. Uh, it may worsen dyskinesias and predispose to falls, just like DEVOPA, and it may induce freezing from stimulation settings. And I've seen that, seen this uh, a few times. And uh, you know, sometimes people with, with deep brain stimulation surgery, um, they have they're set on very high frequencies, and in those subset of patients who are having freezing after deep brain stimulation surgery. Uh, if you just go down on the setting, that can actually improve their gait and balance significantly. 
um, and, and you know it may induce uh, freezing you know the on freezing on time freezing all right so what can we do about it okay so just like we discussed the causes behind um, the causes behind the falls we can you know take one thing at a time the medications that can be used surgeries that can be offered, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and you know, try, simple measures to avoid injuries and, and other measures. So uh, medications, you know, just if somebody is having off time freezing or off time falls, um, so you know, taking a history and evaluation is, is key here. So that's when you decide to just try to increase uh, dopaminergic medication, that's dose of Cinemet, the ropinarol or whatever. And that may help with the symptoms. Um, and then if you, if you think that you're actually inducing the freezing or, or, or falls because of increased dyskinesia, you know, consider reducing the, the dose of medication and seeing if that helps. And, and eliminate the benzodiazepines if possible. Clonazepam and other, sometimes people take alprazolam or you know, the short acting uh, benzodiazepine at night, that's usually not advisable. But. Physiotherapy is very important, and I, I, I usually use that uh, a lot in my practice. Uh, and then they help with you know, practicing transfers, they improve with cardiovascular fitness, uh, they train you in using your you know, cues to walk. Sometimes people develop these you know, um, big step or, or you know, uh, uh, I've seen these, you know, the spouse sometimes helps the, the patient to you know, say, uh, whenever they see them freezing, you know, big step, big step, and then they actually start taking those big steps of cues and chaining technique. Chaining technique, that, that means um, avoiding multitasking. So instead of doing two or three things at the same time, you do one thing and so you break it down. So, you know, you, you, you can imagine the, you know, the, the concept. Um, so if, if you're going to, you know, there are, you have to take off your shoes, you have to, go and sit down somewhere or, you know, and then go to the bed, you know, just, okay, I'm gonna sit down first, take my shoes off, then I'm going to start walking towards my, my uh, chair, and then I'm going to do whatever I'm gonna do. So instead of, you know, doing too many things at the same time, you break it down, so that's called chaining technique. And then you, you know, they train to use, you, use walking aids, they help you to reduce fear of falls. If somebody has fallen and they have this significant fear of falling, then they, you know, they, they encourage you and then they say, you know what, you can do this and they can help reduce the fear of falling. And, and then the interaction with others actually significantly, you know, it helps um, during physical therapy. All right. So simple measures to avoid injury, um, you, know, peop, you know, you want to protect those, you know, um, hips, so hip or wrist protectors, uh, shock absorbing surfaces when where the patient is, you know, uh, most at um, restricting um, unsupervised activities and and treat osteoporosis um, so if you if you fall you're more likely to have a fracture if you have osteoporosis so make sure that you know people address that primary care physician is especially occupational therapy you know they, they help you to remove domestic hazards make sure there are no rugs that can you know have these wrinkles on it and you trip on it uh, proper footwear and walking aids and then stereotactic neurosurgery um, uh, so this can be considered in young people who have dopamine responsive symptoms. Um, but then we don't usually you know, promise this, but then it, it sometimes helps. We, when we examine patients in the off symptoms, you know, if we tell them to you know, don't skip a couple of doses of medication and come to us on examination, then we examine this called UPDRS. We ask them to do, you know, do a bunch of things and we get a number the right-sided number, the left-sided number, and the, the midline number, and then we also access GATE gait during that evaluation. We give them their medication, and then the, we evaluate them in about an hour or so again, and then we actually give them new numbers and compare those two numbers, and then see if they are actually candidates for debris and surgery or not. So that's when we figure out, you know what, the gait significantly improved when we gave the medication. So in those patients, we can, you know, cautiously, you know, give them this optimism uh, that the gait actually may, may improve somewhat, uh, but we, we can't really promise that. And then, like I, I mentioned earlier, you know, deep brain stimulation surgery, there are two 
main targets. Uh, there's STN and GPI. Uh, people with STN uh, stimulation, if, uh, we, if we can reduce the, um, the setting uh, of uh, pe people who have deep brain stimulation surgery, uh, that can actually sometimes help with, with freezing. Other measures, um, you know, avoid daily alcohol. Uh, new, new study. So no amount of alcohol is good for you. <laughs> this is in the news. Um, you know, before they used to say um, glass of red wine, stuff like that. But you know, so, so uh, treat orthostatic hypotension. Um, very important. Uh, and then uh, electronic warning systems to you know find out if somebody is, is you know falling or at risk of falling. So this is the the big picture. So a busy slide though, but I'll walk you through it. So postural instability, gait disorders, and freezing of gait and orthostatic syncope. These are you know, main, three main things that lead to frequent falls. Now, if somebody is having frequent falls, they will have fractures, other injuries, and fear of falling. All these three situations lead to immobilization. Now, immobilization will lead to osteoporosis and lead to more likelihood of fractures. It will lead to insomnia, and you're, if you're unable to sleep, that will lead you to have more falls the next day. It will also cause cognitive impairment because you're unable to get that refreshing sleep. You're unrefreshed. You know, the next day you're sleepy, uh, inattentive, and then that causes more cognitive impairment. So it just feeds into the, the problem. And then immobility also causes re uh, reduced um, fitness. So you're not as active or fit anymore. And that causes more cardiovascular risk problems. Okay? It also causes constipation. You know, constipation causes more, more nocturia. So, so more um, uh, urine production at night, and then you know you're having even worse sleep at night because you have to get up more frequently at night. And then uh, it also causes social isolation. And if you're socially isolated because you you can't actually leave your house, you 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 decide you 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 don't want to interact with anybody because you you're falling so much, you know, and then you end up having more cognitive impairment, and that can lead to more frequent falls. Um, so that's, I think, the big, big, big picture. Uh, these are my three kids, Ahmad, Danish, and Hisham. They're in Kansas City. And thank you for your attention.